Okay, hi. Uh, my name is Hugh Lovner, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Unlike most of the uh, speakers here, which have gone into detail about what they've done, <clears throat> my talk, at least most part of it, will be what I haven't done. Uh, my topic is, when Rich asked me to come up with something, I think, well, what about <clears throat> what the effect of uh, AI on society, which has been a topic that has inter interested me greatly. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's one of the reasons I went into, uh, uh, or actually came up with a Logan Prize. Uh, the um, history of predictions, of course, is somewhat cloudy, problematic. I had, I'm searching the internet, I found out what some previous uh, predictions were. For example, in 1954, the, well, 54, 49 uh, popular mechanics wrote, when a calculator on the ENIAC is equipped, while, where a calculator on the ENIAC is equipped with 18,000 vacuum tubes and weighs 30 tons, computers in the future may have only 1,000 vacuum tubes and weigh only 1.5 tons. <laughs> you see where that's going. Now, there's, you know, there are other ones there. The submarine will never work and so forth. Uh, so when I say what is the effect of what is the future of AI and society, I have a um, there's a rich background that <clears throat> tends to indicate that I'll probably be wrong. But on the other hand, with that proviso in mind, let's go on. The, um, I think the adumbration of what the future of <clears throat> AI and society will be has actually been proposed in, this, in, in some of the talks here. And there has been a single-minded devotion in terms of labor safety. The, reference desk and how we were able to answer questions without people. The, uh, I, for example, have used on occasion, I was a Julie, Amtrak, I take Amtrak a lot, and Julie has a user agent, uh, text, you know, not text, but uh, speech, to speak, speech of it, and she's so perky and sexy that I wanted to ask her out for a date. Honestly, I, let me tell you, she knew exactly what I was saying. I said, I want to go from A to B, and she said, no problem, we'll do it, and that was it, like that. Normally, I just go on the internet, though, and type in my questions, get my things back, without, and, without ever seeing it. Uh, <clears throat> the, the UI, the virtual agents, have, done, uh, have begun to replace humans in a large portion, or at least relieve a lot of labor. Uh, ATMs, you don't go to the bank anymore for money, you put the plastic in and out comes money. So uh, what is the future of AI on society? My guess is it's 100% on Now, these are early days, of course. You say, oh, no, no, we can't have that. My goodness, humans will never be replaced. I remember, I remember when, when I was a little one, that they said you'd never get a brain with the intelligence of a human because it would have to be as large as the Empire State Building and take all the water in Niagara Falls to cool it. Really? That was back in the vacuum tube, along with the ENIAC. And you never hear that anymore. Never at all. So actually, I do believe, and that's the bottom, that's it, you can go home now, that the um, future of AI in society is 100% unemployment. The problem is going to be getting there and what we do. I, what I mean this, what I think is that eventually it will be possible for AI to assume the production, all production. Uh, we have it, uh, perhaps an, uh, a hint of what it's like by looking at agriculture. Um, in 19, let's see, where is it? In 1900, I have to remember this. In 1900, the 40% um, of the population 41% of the workforce was in agriculture. 41%, 1900. 30 years later, it was cut in half, almost, to 21.5. In 1945, it was 16%. Uh, today, it's 1.9% of the workforce. Ooh, wow. Now, that isn't AI, of course. That's simply mechanization. But it shows what can happen. From 40%, and then, by the way, 1900, you know, back then, I'm sure, Earlier, it might have been 60 or 70 percent. Has essentially eliminated agricultural work. I mean, it's, it's practically nothing. And now agriculture is 0.7 percent of the jet, uh, gross domestic product. Back in the uh, 30s, it was 7 percent. The real problem is going to be to 
distribute the goods produced by these automata. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm personally in favor of unemployment. I happen to like unemployment. I've hated working all my life. I've never enjoyed it. Uh, if you have to do, if somebody has to pay you to do it, uh, well, that's it. I mean, J. M. Barry wrote, I think, that true happiness consists not in doing what one likes, but in liking what one has to do. Um, I mean, please, I, I've had uh, jobs, and my boss has been jerks, so and I know I'm a boss, and I'm a jerk. What do you want? I mean, <laughs> I'm able to understand that. Um, Right, when, when somebody the uh, next IT said we want to make more human life, no, make it less human life. I mean, humans are always going out for coffee, they come in late, they, they want raises, they talk back, uh, please, please. I mean, no, I, the last thing an employer wants is employees, or a manufacturer wants is employees. I, I read, I'm doing some research on this, there's a theory, an economic theory, that uh, if you get increased productivity, it's not that they're going to reduce the, the employees, they're just going to increase production. I think that's a bit an economist and not a manager. Because give me the bread now, it's, employees are a problem. They kind of get sick. I really, it's, it's just one of those things. And if we can get robots to do the work, right? Boy, I guys came up with this when I was very young. My mother was always a fan of science fiction. I mean, I can always remember. Before, how many know have heard of analog, analog science fiction, right? Now, well, even before analog, it was astounding science fiction. That's how all it goes back. They were, they were, I mean, you know, uh, Heinlein with, with his foundation. I read them in the original when they came out of the first you know, issues. And so um, I said, that's pretty neat, you know, that's pretty neat. And it was uh, my uh, interest in un uh, getting unemployment that uh, and having computers do all the work that got me to. Interested in uh, the Turing test and intelligence, artificial intelligence, and um, I was working at the University of Maryland. Uh, I was working at uh, Massachusetts State of uh, Massachusetts the Department of Unemployment Insurance or whatever, and they had a language there. Uh, it was called Macro, regular expression, uh, recursion. It was very good. And I said, "Wow, you know, this might be brand program that would pass the Turing test." <laughs> anyway, and I said, hmm, "You know, there's no place I could enter it." I said, "That's a good idea." And I uh, suggested it to my father, and he said, ah, when I'm dead, you can do it. I mean, he's a very pragmatic guy. I'm very, very clever, very, you know, he's great with mecha uh, mechanical things. Not very logical, but very mechanical. And so he died. And then uh, uh, Robert Epstein came by. I said, you know, Robert, it would be nice to have this uh, contest where somebody could uh, enter a, a Turing test. You know, uh, he said, Hugh, that's a wonderful idea. Let my let my organization, the Cambridge Center, do that, which I had never understood why he formed it. He formed this nonprofit for behavioral research. I said, sure, why not? Um, and so that, the idea was that, uh, you know, I'd like to go to at 3 o'clock in the morning if I want to go to a store and buy a widget. And there's nobody there, there's no clerks. But if they had a, a, you know, a human intellect there, I could go in and get it, one of your artificial intelligence. But the real problem, as I say, is getting to the point at which the goods are distributed. For example, the Irish famine. You've heard of the Irish famine, 1848, thereabouts in Ireland, Irish famine, and the potato fail, potato blight. And uh, millions, uh, maybe a million people starved to death in Ireland at that time. <clears throat> but at the very same time, the Irish or the English were exporting food, or importing food from, exporting from Ireland to England, wheat or food while people were starving. It's not a very you know, nice thing, but so the, the actual, there's a sort of a inertial barrier to get to this final state. Um, the Luddites, for example, and, and there's a great deal of resistance, too. I mean, the Luddites were a group in uh, around uh, what, 1800 in England, uh, when the first uh, automated looms came in. Uh, Ned Ludd was a uh, apparently a fictional character, but a lot of um, artisans were thrown off or out of work because these looms were now automated, you know, they just they had the automatic shuttle, the flying shuttle, or run, whatever, it's not a loomer, and, uh, or weaver. And so they'd go around, you know, smashing these machines with their sledgehammers, I think they call them Enix, from the hammer of Enix or some such. And the <clears throat> English, of course, in their uh, understated way, made destroying machines at capital offense. <laughs> Actually, 13 people were hanged at one point for destroying machines. So there's, a, there's going to be a problem getting there. I'm not quite sure how we'll get there. 
but it's almost inexorable given the force of manufacturing. Employers desire to, that's 10 minutes, five minutes, whatever, uh, in order to eliminate workers. I'm, I'm sorry, folks. I mean, if you're a good worker or a drone or whatever, that's just coming down the path. Uh, and the idea that, you know, people say, well, work is necessary, we've got to work, blah, blah, blah. No, that's, you've just been, you've just been rainbow. Uh, I don't know how many have heard of a liberal education. How many have heard of a liberal education? You know, get, liberal, get a good education, get a good job, get a liberal education, right? Wrong. It turns out that the term liberal comes from liberal meaning free, meaning freedom from work. There's a liberal education and there's a vocational education. A vocational education was to teach you a job. But the liberal education, going back to Plato's Academy, was to prepare the person for life without work. How to, you know, the, the, the unexamined life isn't worth living, blah, 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 blah. I mean, it was considered shameful to work. You know, if you read, if you read a romance novel, which is my not-so-secret advice anymore, I mean, to smell of the shop. Oh, my goodness, you can't marry him. Matilda, she, he smells the shop. Yeah. No, 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 no. The idea is you have to uh, waste your time on how shiny your shoes are. That's the big thing, you know, has, so that's, uh, that's really it. it. It sounds, I mean, as I say, it's, it's the history of predictions is very classy and it's not known for its accuracy, but um, there's a strong, a, a very strong force to just increase productivity until the time it becomes infinite. And uh, there are practically no areas, I think, that are invulnerable.